This is our story, the story of Islam. Last episode, we looked at the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, receiving revelation in the cave. And he ran to his wife, rushed to his wife Khadija, asking her, cover me, cover me. Now I want you to imagine your husband comes to you saying that he has had this experience with an angel who you know, uh, held him tight from behind. Most of us, imagine, would pretty much think this person has gone crazy. And then Nabi Sallallahu was actually in a situation where he was questioning, did this really happen? Did something happen to me? But Khadija radiallahu anha was very supportive as a wife. So what did she say to him? She covered him and she said, Abshir, fawallahi la yukhzik Allahu abada. Don't be sad. This is good news. God will never disgrace you. Why? Wallahi innaka la tasli rahim By Allah, you keep good relations with your relatives. And you speak the truth. You help the poor and the destitute to a point where you win their hearts. You entertain your guests generously. And you always assist those who are stricken with any calamity. Did she leave it there? No. She went and said, let's go to Waraqa together. And Waraqa was one of the few men who has learned about revelation, about these things. He was one of four monotheists that we know by name from this era. So he believed in one God and he turned away from the worship of the idols and he dedicated himself to the Christian way of life, which he thought at the time would be the best option available to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this Quran that was revealed to Muhammad. Imagine the first revelation that was given to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah describes the nature of the Qur'an. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا We have sent you, O Prophet, a revelation. It's a spirit through our command. Imagine the Qur'an has got a life of its own. It wakes you up. مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابِ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ You did not know about this book or about faith before. But we made it a light by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide whomever He wills. And you will through this revelation guide to a straight path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet Muhammad later on in Revelation. قُلْ لَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ مَا تَلَوْتُهُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَلَا أَدْرَاكُمْ بِهِ Say to them, had Allah willed, I would have never recited it to you. Nor would, you have made, nor would I have made it known to you. فَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ عُمُرًا مِّنْ قَبْلِهِ I had lived my whole life amongst you before this revelation. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ so here we're told in Surah Yunus that the Quran is reminding the community of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam that they knew him, they trusted him, they called him the honest, the trustworthy. They knew him. He was a businessman that they respected his decision. They honored and admired and showed respect to. So now, 40 years have passed. He was not known for revelation, not known for this Quran, not known for this. It's new, it's out of the bloom. So many people consider the suddenness with which Muhammad's message comes to him وسلم, is in itself an indication that this is not from him. It's outside of him. The speech of the Quran is very different from the speech of Muhammad وسلم. And over the course of 23 years, the revelation would come. Now when Khadija took Muhammad وسلم, to Waraqa, what did Waraqa say? Waraqa said, I wish I'm alive. I wish I'm alive. When your people force you out of your home so that I can be there to support you and I can be there to show you commitment. He picked the time in which the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would be most in need. And he's telling him, he's foreshadowing, no Prophet has come with something like this except that the people forced this individual out, cornered, hurt, persecuted, tortured. And so he says, oh, Are they going to actually try to kick me, to try to remove me out of my own city? He says, Yes. And I would love to be there available and to support you at the time in which you're going to be in need of it the most. Now, Waraqa does not make it, does not live long enough 
to publicize his support for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but some consider him to be the first Muslim. So what was the early revelation like? The early Quran, short ayat, speaking about the human nature, the human psychology, the relationship that one should have with Allah. The early revelation focused on the word Rabb. Rabb meaning the things that Allah does for you. Later on, the Quran would refer to Allah, refer to God using the word Allah, the things that you should be doing, expected of you, having recognized the favor of Allah upon you. So let's look at some of this revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ we created the human being in the best form. And the human being has the capacity to be reduced to the lowest of the low. Except who? Those who believe. And do righteous deeds. They will have a never ending reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would describe Jannah to these people in Mecca. Reward from your Lord. Ata'an, a gift. You don't do it, you don't deserve it because of your deeds. He gives it to you, but your deeds are what's necessary to show that you are genuinely in need that you're turning to Allah and you're recognizing your limits ya Allah on my own I can't but through you I can Allah would describe Jahannam inna Jahannam kanat mirsada litaghina ma'aba Allah would describe heaven and hell to encourage to reward to deter and to punish to give a reason for those who want to hold on to give an incentive encouragement for those who are looking for truth to give a reason for those who are in a position of power slow down look deep within you ask yourself is this how you want to come back to your creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the early revelation tells the companions, tells the people uh, in Mecca, tells the audience, think about time. By the passage of time. The human being is in a grave state of loss. Time is always ticking. Time waits for no one. Don't just watch by the side as your life leaves you. Everyone is losing except who? Those who believe. And show that belief by committing good deeds, by doing good. And encouraging each other to, do to, 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 to see and to speak and to share that which is true. And to be patient and encouraging each other to be patient. So the Quran is giving the audience a sense of social responsibility. That you're responsible for encouraging good. That you're responsible for sharing truth. And the early revelation emphasized the importance of accountability and resurrection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them of the final day. Listen to this carefully. Look at the power of the Quran. <laughs> when the earth is shaken, it's ultimate quaking. And the earth throws out all of its secrets. Imagine the earth is carrying all of these secrets. The image here, imagine the earth is carrying all of this pain and the secrets of generations and stories of people who fell and people who rose and empires and kings and leaders and soldiers and warriors and women and all of these societies and cultures and supposed religions that are manufactured and constructed. All of, all of this news, the earth will spill out all of the secrets. Imagine all that was buried. All of it will come out. And the human being on that day will say, what is wrong with, what's happening? What's going on? The earth will be made to tell its story. Having been inspired by your Lord to do so. People will come from every direction, every separate way to be shown their deeds, to be shown the consequences of that work. 
يعمل. The Quran is encouraging them to work, to do. Whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Every decision, everything that's done, you will have to stand for the consequences. The Quran also, in the early uh, Quranic revelation, we have a shift and a focus on getting the, compa- getting the, the audience to think, to, to really critically analyze their own state, their own condition. Look at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Look at the imagery. I want us to live the Quran. Live the Quran together. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this image of galloping horses that are panting. So imagine we're focusing on the horse's face. We're imagining the panting, seeing the horse move quickly. Now the Quran gets us to zoom on the hooves of the horse, striking sparks of fire with their hooves. Now the focus shifts to the person riding the horse, launching an attack in dawn. Now the Quran shifts to the background. Clouds of dust are forming. Now the Quran shifts to the people that are being attacked, penetrating the camp of the enemy into two lines. The heart of enemy is divided. Wait a second. I'm excited, yes. There's a, there's, a, there's a story being told about horses attacking, people being attacked. But the shift here is incredible. The Quran doesn't tell you what's happening with the battle. The Quran shifts to talk about human nature. The human being to his Lord, to her Lord, to their Lord is ungrateful. وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٌ And you yourself as a human being will attest to your gratitude. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٌ And they certainly attest to their love, extreme love for worldly gains. So what's the connection here between the horses attacking everything that's going on and love for the world and gratitude? Those who reflect, the Qur'an is getting them to think. It moves into the past, it moves into the present. It interrupts, foreshadows about the future and interrupts them in the present to get them to look within themselves. As if we're being told, think about when the horse is being led by its master towards danger, towards a war. The horse doesn't want to go to the war, naturally, but the horse does what the master wills and what the master says because the horse has provided food, water, shelter by the human master. So the horse obeys. The horse shows loyalty. But we provided food, shelter, love, the ability to love, the ability to experience love, the heart through which we love, the tongue through which we speak, the hands through which we move, all of these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, that God has given us, that Allah has given us, we take them for granted. And we say, no, thank you, but no thank you. We don't commit to Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is po- you know, pointing our ingratitude by getting us to compare, by getting the Quranic audience to compare themselves to the creatures that they were so in love with, the horses and the camels. So the Quran tells its audience, look above you to the skies and think about how this was formulated. Look below you at the ground and think about how it came to be. Look at the camel, look at the horse, look at the tree, look at the stars, look at the sun. And the early Quran would start taking oath. Allah takes an oath by all of these things around them to get them to think and to reflect about the reality that they're living in. Where does all of this come from? What's the purpose of all of this? And they recognized that God existed, that He's the one who created them, but they said, well, He created us, but He left us on our own to do as we will, some of them said. Or He created us, but you know, this is kind of like all that, all, all that there is. It's just this life. We live and we die and nothing basically brings us to an end except time. So imagine subhanAllah, Allah brings the attention to all of these things. Do they not know what will happen when the contents of the grave 
will it spill out? Will spill out? وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ And the secrets of the hearts will be laid bare. إِنَّ رَبَّهُمْ بِهِمْ يَوْمِئِذٍ لَخَبِيرٍ Surely their Lord is aware of them on that day. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will point at their competitiveness. Allah will tell them, أَلْهَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ Your competition for more, for worldly gains has distracted you. حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ Until you ended up in your graves. أَلْهَاكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرُ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ Indeed, if you were to know your fate with certainty, you would have acted differently. And indeed, you will come to see لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِينَ you will see Jahannam. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ That on that day you will definitely be asked about the pleasures that God has given you. Now we turn our attention to the earliest converts of Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ struggle with the Quraysh, the elite in Mecca. And we're also going to look at the Qur'an and how it employs fear and love, the promise of reward and the warning of a punishment to wake them up, reminding them to be grateful for what they have, not to take it for granted and to act before it's too late. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds Quraysh, don't take your money for granted, don't take your power for granted. Remember, أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا Don't they see? أَنَّا جَعَلْنَا حَرَمًا آمِنًا we give them Mecca as a sacred safe haven. And people are snatched from all around them. Are they going to believe in falsehood? And deny Allah's favors? The Meccans took pride in claiming, as we said, to be the inheritors of the legacy of Ismail and Ibrahim's son. It's through this legacy that they justified their dominion over the Kaaba. The Kaaba offered them a sanctuary away from the troubles and the raids of the desert. It's in this Mecca, safe haven, the businesses and trade thrived. Quraysh was making a lot of money from the sale of the idols and the facilitation of the pilgrimage. And that's why they said to him, as the Quran says, وَقَالُوا إِنَّ اتَّبِعُوا الْهُدَى مَعَكَ نُتَخَطَّفْ مِنْ أَرْضِنَا أَوَلَمْ نُمَكْنَا لهم حرما آمنا يجبى إليه ثمرات. They say to the Prophet, if we were to follow you, truly this guidance with you, we would certainly be snatched from our land. Why? Because then we've given up this Mecca, we've given up the the whole safe haven here, we've given up what distinguishes us from everybody else. So we wouldn't be able to travel as freely, we wouldn't be able to have our caravans secured as freely. So imagine for them, it's about money, it's about power. Okay, it doesn't matter whether what you're saying is true or not. We can't because you're asking for too much. You're asking us to give our bread and butter. This is what, this is, this is what we need. We can't give it up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds them, the one who established this safe haven for you and gave you Mecca and all the fruits that come to you, you don't even have to leave. All of this is coming to you. Do you not think the one who gave you that can give you better or the same in this world and in the next and if he's given you that, shouldn't he be grateful for it? Rather than take the privilege and not fall through with the responsibility. So they thought that turning away from the idolatry and turning away from idol worshipping and the house of God would lead to the collapse of their business, compromise their privileges and make them equal with the rest of the Harabs. And the loss in status in their eyes threatened them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ عَيْلَةً فَسَوْفَ يُغْنِيكُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنْ شاء. If you fear poverty, Allah will enrich you out of His bounty. If He wills, surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all-knowing, all-wise. Not everybody rejected, not everybody denied, not everybody disbelieved. Among the earliest converts were Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr came to the Prophet Muhammad and when he heard the Quran, when he heard the Prophet Muhammad explain, he became a Muslim without hesitation. 
and he started calling others to Islam. Zayd became a Muslim. Ali ibn Abi Talib became a Muslim. Khadija, of course, the Prophet Muhammad's wife, supported him and became a Muslim. And Zayd was the servant. He was a slave who was freed by the Prophet Muhammad. He, was, he, he lived with the Prophet Muhammad and was raised by the Prophet Muhammad. To the point where when he found his parents, they were given, he was given the choice. The parents gave him a choice. You can stay with Muhammad or come with us. And he said, I would like to stay with Muhammad. Abu Bakr himself took it upon himself to go out and to start calling to Islam, to call his friends to Islam. And because Abu Bakr was a businessman, he called many, many of his businessmen friends to Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayat that talk about invitation. Whose words are better than the one who invites others, calls others to Allah and says, I am truly from the Muslims, from those who submit. And I want you to imagine, subhanAllah, that Khadija, because she was very supportive to the Prophet Muhammad that a Nabi was one day approached by Jibreel, as according to the hadith of Abu Hurairah, and Rasulullah tells us that Jibreel, came and he says, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, Hadi Khadija, this is Khadija, she's on her way, coming with some food and some drink. فَإِذَا هِيَ أَتَتْكَ فَأَقْرِئْ عَلَيْهَا السَّلَامِ مِنْ رَبِّهَا وَمِنِّي وَبَشِّرْهَا بِبَيْتٍ فِي الْجَنَّةِ مِنْ قَصَبْ لَا صَخَبَ فِيهِ وَلَا نَصَبْ So imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Jibreel and Jibreel says, Ya Rasulullah, Khadija is on her way to bring you some food as he was coming back to the uh, to, the, to the cave for more. And he says, listen to this carefully, Khadija is coming with uh, some, food, some food and some, uh, some drink. And when she reaches you, greet her on behalf of Allah and on my behalf and give her the glad tidings of having a palace in paradise made out of a special type of plant or fruit, qasab. In there she will have no noise nor fatigue. And as we mentioned, then Ali became a Muslim, then Zayd became a Muslim, then Abu Bakr went out and started calling his friends to Islam. And because of his efforts, Abu Bakr was able to bring five people of his best friends to Islam. Once again, capturing the spirit of calling people to Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Abu Bakr and, and those like him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحَ وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ whose words are better than the one who invites others to the path of Allah, shows them the path of Allah, and says, I'm one of the Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيْئَةِ إِدْفَعَ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةِ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ Good and evil cannot be equal. Respond to evil with that which is better. You will come to realize that the one between you and whom there's feud will become a close, warm friend. But remember, وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَ إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٍ No one can attain this except those who are patient and no one attains it except those who are fortunate. Five of the ten companions that were guaranteed Jannah came to Islam because of the work of Abu Bakr. Most of them were businessmen, which shows you that those who came to Islam, many of them were from the middle class, the business class, who wanted to make the society better, but did not know how. And they did not like the political leadership of the time. Those were Uthman ibn Affan, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Talha ibn Ubaidullah, and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. May Allah bless you. Bless your Ramadan. Mubarak for you and your family. See you next time.